Hey, welcome back, my WAP stars. We are moving on to Unit 3, Land-Based Empires. We're going to be talking about the Gunpowder Empires, the Russian Empire, the Qing Manchurian Dynasty of China, the Tokugawa Shogunate of Japan, and finally, the rise of European nation-states and the solidification of their absolute power thanks to things like Protestant Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, and the Scientific Revolution. So we're going to dive right in and start with the Gunpowder Empires. And our first topic is going to be the Ottoman Empire. I want you to take a quick look at their expansions, look where they started, and then look where they're going to end. All right. Osman established the Ottoman Empire in northwestern Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey, in 1300. He and his successors consolidated control over Anatolia, and then they fought Christian enemies in Greece and in the Balkans. They then captured Serbia and the Byzantine capital of Constantinople in 1453. Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who reigned from 1520 to 1566, conquered Belgrade and Rhodes, and then laid siege to Vienna. But when winter came, he withdrew. The Ottoman Empire fought with Venice for two centuries as it attempted to exert control over the Mediterranean region. The Ottomans forced the Venetians to pay tribute, but they did allow the Venetians to trade. Muslim merchants in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean requested Ottoman naval support against the Portuguese. And the Ottomans initially responded quite vigorously to the Portuguese threats against their nearby ports. But they really saw no reason to commit quite a bit of effort to the defense of non-Ottoman Muslim merchants elsewhere in the Indian Ocean. This is because goods still flowed um, into their markets unimpeded. There was no issue. They didn't get involved. The original Ottoman military forces consisted of mounted warriors armed with bows, and they were supplemented in the late 14th century when the Ottomans formed a new troop called the Janissary, and these were made of Balkan Christian men. They fought on foot and they were armed with guns, but times changed. And in the early 15th century, the Ottomans began to recruit men for the Janissary and positions in the bureaucracy. This was done through a levy or a tax on male Christian children, particularly from the Balkan regions. To be in the Janissary Corps was considered an honor. It meant you were the best of the best. But to the parents of these Christian male children, it meant your child was being taken away from you. And it actually wasn't uncommon for parents to maim their children to prevent them from being taken. Ottoman land forces were powerful enough to defeat the Safawids. But the Ottomans were defeated at sea by combined Christian forces at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. The Ottoman Empire was an incredibly cosmopolitan society. And you see a certain class of people, they are the Osmanli speaking tax exempt military class called the Askari. And they serve as soldiers and bureaucrats to the Sultan. Because of that, they're exempt from paying taxes. In the view of the Ottomans, the Sultan supplied justice and defense for the common people called the Raya. In exchange, the Raya support the Sultan and his military through their taxes. In practice, common people had very little contact with the Ottoman government. They were ruled by local notables and by their own religious principles. Going back, as you can see just by the vastness of this empire, that's going to have to be a requirement. You are going to have bureaucrats who govern other territories and administer control and keep everything organized. Given the fact that the Ottoman Empire was so large, you can imagine, I said it was cosmopolitan, it's incredibly diverse. So one way the Ottomans stay in power is they're pretty, pretty tolerant of other religions. Essentially, people pay a special tax, it's called the jizya, and you're left alone. All right. The crisis of the military state, economic change, and growing weaknesses. The increasing importance and expense of firearms meant that the size and cost of the Janissaries would increase over time. And the importance of the Turkish cavalry, who also happened to be the landholders, decreased. So essentially, guys, what's happening is the cavalry's out and the infantry is in. 
everybody is learning how to fight with firearms and people who don't have firearms or don't use firearms are going to face multiple rising powers throughout the world and unfortunately they are going to lose. While this is happening, while the Janissary is rising in importance, while the cavalry is decreasing, silver from the new world, and I use that in air quotes, y'all, brought inflation and it undermined the purchasing power of the fixed tax income of the cavalry. This is not good, guys. Inflation is never a good thing. Taxes, never a good thing. Financial deterioration is coming. The use of short-term mercenary soldiers brought a wave of rebellions and banditry to Anatolia. Mercenary soldiers, guys, they're soldiers for hire. The Janissaries began to marry. They went into business and they enrolled their sons in the Janissary Corps. They grow in number, but decline in military readiness. So again, the Janissary Corps is becoming this very, very privileged group. They're becoming bureaucrats, but they're not becoming soldiers. That's an issue. The period of crisis led to significant changes in Ottoman institutions. The Sultan lived a very secluded life in his palace, and the affairs of the government were thus in the hands of chief administrators. The Janissary became a politically powerful hereditary elite, and they spent more time on creating artisanal goods, focusing on trade, than on actual military training. In rural areas, the system of land grants in return for military services had been replaced by a system of tax farming, it is not what you want, y'all. Rural administration came to depend on powerful provisional governors and wealthy tax farmers. So essentially, guys, tax farming goes in one of two ways. You work somebody else's land, you give them a share of your crops, you call it a day. Or tax farming is also in order to collect taxes, the sultan would send people out to these rural farms where they don't get paid by the sultan. So essentially, let's just say the sultan says, hey, um, farmer A owes me two pounds of gold. Get my two pounds and whatever else you get from this guy, that is your payment. So let's just say farmer A has three pounds of gold and this tax farmer is going and taking all three pounds. That's how he gets paid. So obviously, this is not a good form of tax collection. People got really angry about this. In the context of disorder and decline, places like Izmir flourished as Ottoman control over trade declined and European merchants came to purchase Iranian silk and local agricultural products. This growing trade brought the agricultural economies of Western Anatolia, the Balkans, and the Mediterranean coast into the European commercial network. This is going to allow European merchants to slowly infiltrate and then take over. By the middle of the 18th century, it was clear that the Ottoman Empire was in a serious economic and military decline. They were nicknamed by European kingdoms, the sick man of Europe. That is not a nickname that you want. It does not inspire confidence. Trade agreements called capitulations led to European domination. My apologies. Led to European domination of Ottoman import and export trade by sea. They did not control strategic ports or establish colonial settlements on Ottoman territory. During the tulip period, uh, what we have is a period of time where the Ottoman ruling class enjoyed the luxury goods coming in from Europe. They also replicated what was called Dutch tulip mania. So essentially, in the Netherlands, people could not get enough of tulips, and that is going to spread to the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately, what else will happen is what's called the Patrona Halil Rebellion. And this occurred in 1730. This focused on a weakness of the central power. Provisional elites took advantage of this weakness to increase their own power and their own wealth. So Sultan Ahmed III, with Mahmoud I, and the Tulip period. Uh, how this ends is with the Patrona Halil Rebellion. So essentially, Patrona Halil rises up. He has 12,000 followers of the Janissary Corps, and they're mostly Albanians. He is killed at the end of this rebellion, along with 7,000 of his followers. All right, what we are looking at now, guys, is the Safawids. 
Ismail declared himself the Shah of Iran in 1502, and he ordered that his followers and subjects all adopt to Shiite or Shia Islam. And what this is going to do is going to create a very deep gap between Iran and its Sunni neighbors. So everyone around Iran is Sunni. Everybody in Iran is now Shia or Shiite. Conversion to Shiite belief made permanent the cultural differences between Iran and its Arab neighbors. And these differences have been developing from the 10th century onward. But what we'll see is a distinction of Persian literature and decorative styles. And these had already been diverging from Arabic culture. This process intensified when the Mongols destroyed Baghdad. And when this occurred, that put an end to the city's role as a very strong influence and educational center of Islamic culture. Under the Safawids, Iranian culture was further distinguished by the strength of Shiite beliefs. And this included the concept of the hidden imam and the deeply emotional annual commemoration of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. And that goes back to the original split between the Sunnis and the Shias with the assassination of Hussein and his entire family. Iran's manufactured goods included silk and beautiful carpets. And this is really what they were known for were their carpets. Overall, the manufacturing sector was small and not very productive. The agricultural sector, which included farming and herding, did not see any significant technological developments. And this is in part because nomad chieftains who actually ruled the rural areas had no interest in building the agricultural economy. Like the Ottomans, the Safawids were plagued by the expensive firearms and the reluctance of nomad warriors to actually use these firearms. Shah Abbas responded by establishing a slave corps of year-round professional soldiers who were armed with guns. In the late 16th century, once again, we are back to that cheap silver by inflation. Um, just quick sidebar, we will be talking about the Colombian Exchange. We'll talk about the discovery of silver mines in Potosi and how that pretty much decimated the entire world economy. Just a little background for you. Or... A little contextualization. Um, but anyway, the inflation that's caused by the silver, as well as the decline in overland trade, made it difficult for the Safawid state to pay its army and the bureaucracy. And what will hap happen is an army from Afghanistan is going to notice these financial difficulties, if you will, and they're going to take advantage of that by leading an attack they capture the capital city of Isfahan, and they end Safawid rule in 1722. So one thing I'd like to talk about next, a tale of two cities, Isfahan versus Istanbul. Now, by the way, Istanbul was actually called Constantinople still during this time. The city will not be renamed Istanbul until the 20th century. Isfahan and Istanbul were very different in their outward appearance. Istanbul, and I'm saying that because that's the name of the city now, again, still Constantinople, but Istanbul was a very busy port city, and it had a colony of European merchants, given that it belonged to the Byzantine, that's to be expected. Also, its geographic location, that's to be expected. Istanbul also had a walled palace and a skyline punctured by brick domes and soaring minarets. Isfahan was an inland city with very few Europeans, unobtrusive minarets, brightly tiled domes, and an open palace with a huge plaza for polo games. Both cities were built for walking, not for wheeled vehicles. They had few open spaces, narrow and irregular streets, and artisan and merchant guilds. Women were seldom seen in public in Istanbul or in Isfahan. They were confined in women's quarters in their homes, but... Records do indicate that Ottoman women were active in the real estate market and appeared in court cases. Public life pretty much belonged to men. Despite an Armenian merchant community, Isfahan was not cosmopolitan, nor did it have the type of diversity that you'll see in Istanbul. The population of the Safavid Empire was not as diverse as the Ottomans either, again, given its location. In spite of the fact that the Sultan's wealth was built on territorial possessions and not the voyages of his merchants, 
the empire is going to be very localized. Um, the religion, because of the religious requirements, people will share that religious belief. People who do not share in the Shiite branch of Islam are facing persecution, as opposed to Istanbul, where you actually see quite a bit of diversity, where you actually see that religious tolerance is pretty much the name of the game, guys. Make sure you know the differences between Isfahan and Istanbul. There's a lot of cultural differences here. All right, growth of the Mughal Empire. That's where we're going to wrap up for today. We're going to be talking about the rise and fall of the Mughals. The Mughal Empire was established and consolidated by the Turkic warrior Babur and his grandson Akbar. And Akbar is going to be our major focus. Akbar established a central administration and he granted non-hereditary land revenues. Non-hereditary, y'all to his military officers and government officials. So essentially when you die, it goes back. So people are promoted based on merit. They're rewarded based on merit. Radical, I know. Guys, you can really see how much territory Akbar added. Um, where the Mughal Empire started, I, math is not my forte. I would say he at least triples it in size. Um, and Akbar is known for religion. His successors gave efficient administration and peace to their prosperous northern heartland, and trade will boom. So foreign trade under the Mughals will advance quickly, but the Mughals, much like the Safawids, did not maintain a navy or a uh, merchant marine. They preferred to allow Europeans to serve as carriers, and because we talk about causes and effects a lot, this is going to be a very fatal mistake allowing Europeans to serve as the carriers of trade. This is how Europeans are going to come to dominate Indian Ocean trade. The Mughals inherited traditions of religious tolerance from earlier Muslim rulers, both inside and outside of India. 15% of Mughal officials holding land revenues were Hindus. Most of them were from the northern region. Akbar was the most famous of the Mughal rulers. So you guys got to remember the Mughals are Muslim. Akbar took the throne at 13 and commanded the government on his own at the age of 20. He worked for the reconciliation between Hindus and Muslims by marrying a princess who was Hindu. And he introduced reforms that reduced taxation and legal discrimination against Hindus. He also made himself the center of a very short-lived eclectic religion called the Divine Faith. And he sponsored a court culture in which Hindu and Muslim elements were mixed together. The Mughal Empire would decline after the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. Now, Aurangzeb is really known for expanding out the size of the Mughal Empire. Factors that contributed to the Mughal decline include the land grant system, the failure to completely and truly integrate Aurangzeb's newly conquered territory into imperial administration, and then, given its size, you have to hire governors, the rise of regional powers. The real power of the Mughal rulers came to an end in 1733, after Nadir Shah raided Delhi. The empire would survive in name and in name only until 1858, when it's officially incorporated into the British Empire. As the Mughal government lost power, Mughal regional officials bearing the title of Nawab established their own pretty much more or less independent states, and Nawabs were essentially governors. These regional states were prosperous, but they could not effectively prevent the intrusion of Europeans such as the French. And what will happen is the French will come and they will start capturing trading centers that belong not only to the Mughals, but also to the English. They'll become a power broker in India until eventually England will come to regain their lost territory. And this is the peacock throne. It was a symbol of Mughal power. Now this throne was made of gold and precious gems. And just in case you're wondering why there's team peacock, this is why guys. All right, you know the drill. Email me if you have any questions. And actually what I would like you to do is 
if there's a question that you're not sure about on our guided reading packet, please post it on the classroom. It'd make for a very interesting discussion in class. So have a great night, y'all. Cheers.